Amen. Good morning, Central. It's so great to be here with you and to worship with you. Let's let's lift some praises up to our Lord today.
honored to be your Lord today. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to share in fellowship and worship with each other. And Lord, I pray that you will speak through Sean and whatever message he has for us today. Lord, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Um, it's my pleasure. Is this on? It's my pleasure to uh, introduce to you today our speaker. Uh, but before I do that, let's give the worship team a hand for helping us get prepared for the Lord's message. Uh, there's a lot you could learn about Sean from reading a few websites like uh, LinkedIn and Facebook and different places. You'll find out that he studied in three different places at uh, Ozark and at Lincoln and uh, Talbot School of Theology uh, with Biola. Uh, that he's worked in three different higher ed institutions and that we're lucky to have him here after he recently completed a stint as, I think his title at Ozark was Associate Dean of Online Learning and Innovation which uh, well set him up for what he's been doing here as our VP of academics. It's uh, probably also apropos that Sean has been given the task of speaking about joyful suffering, I think, in the midst of our, in the midst of our uh, messages on 1 Peter, as he is the academic dean, and who causes us more joyful suffering uh, than the academic dean? You can read all of that if you look at what Facebook and different places have to say about Sean. But when you get to know him, you find out a couple of other things. He is an unabashed truth teller. And I appreciate that about Sean. And uh, he's here today with his wife, Jody. They've raised a family together and, and come to be a part of the Central family. And I'm so excited to introduce to you uh, our VP of Academics, Sean Lane. Well, if I mess with my glasses a lot today, it's because I can't see you very well. I, I brought my glasses for my computer, and uh, I was told that it's better to be able to see your, your manuscript than it is to see the people. So yeah, if you're out there, just wave so that I know somebody's alive out there. Mr. Curtis, are you in the nosebleeds up? There you go. Just like that gentleman right there. All right. It's been my habit for quite a few years at graduation time to... Uh, to uh, uh, write a word of uh, greeting and, and whatnot to uh, students about to graduate. And I include a text from Paul to his protege Timothy from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. The text reads, Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them you might fight the battle well, holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so shipwrecked, uh, and have shipwrecked with regard to their faith. Now, after having studied uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 and having done a, a, a pretty significant search over 90 occurrences of suffer, suffer, suffering, suffered, sufferings in the New Testament over the last couple of weeks, I think I might write something different in this year's cards. I think it'll sound something like this, do you want to die? Several years ago, I was reading a book uh, 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 entitled On Fire. I read it because I'm a sucker for biographies and even more so about people who overcome incredible odds. As a nine-year-old, John uh, had been recently observing guys in the neighborhood, older kids, teenagers, high school kids, lighting gasoline on fire on the sidewalk and, and watching it burn and, and making designs on the sidewalk. So he decided he's got to get on, in on this action because when you're nine, you're trying to fit in. You want to be seen as being older than you really are. So both curious and wanting to hone his skills, he went to the garage because that's where the gas is kept, right? And he lit a piece of cardboard on fire and that wasn't really exciting. 
And so he, he needed some fuel, so he grabs a gas can. It was actually really heavy. Turns out it was five gallons. And, and he's only nine, so he, like, he can't just lift this by the handle. So he, gra- he bear hugs that, that uh, five-gallon gas can. And the moment that the fuel hit the lit uh, cardboard on the floor, it shot him across the, the garage, uh, uh, across the garage and hit the wall on the other side. By this point, he's now saturated with fuel all over his body, and the only way to get away from the flames and to get out of there was to run back through them, and to get to help, he had to go into the family house, which, because he's on fire, now the, can we turn this down just a little bit, guys? Because he's on fire, he's now causing everything around him to catch on fire, and it literally burns the house to the ground, but because of a brother's help rolling him in a carpet outside, which, by the way, there was four inches of snow out there, By the time he got to the hospital, he had burns on 100% of his body, 87% of which were third-degree burns. In the medical community, you you measure mortality rate by using a simple calculation of the percentage of the body that's been burned, and then you add the age of the patient to it. 100% plus 9 equals death. Most children in that kind of predicament look to mom and dad for their source of comfort. And John did the same thing after his mom was able to get there. He asked her, am I going to be okay? And he expected a baby, you're going to be fine. We're not going to be here too long. It's going to be okay. You'll be down and out of here in no time. But this was what his mother actually said to him. John, do you want to die? It's your choice not mine. John responded with, No, Mom, I don't want to die. I want to live. And his mom responded with these words, Then, John, you need to fight like you've never fought before. You need to take the hand of God, and you need to walk this journey with him. Race forward with everything that you have. I think that might actually be the central message and theme of 1 Peter, maybe even the entire New Testament. That when it's your goal to live so that you never die, you live differently, fervently, intentionally. It's repeated three times in, in the book of, of, of 1 Peter, chapter 1, 4, and 5, to be alert and to have sober-mindedness, and even more so when experiencing suffering. I'm not really convinced, if I'm being honest this morning, that suffering is the gift in and of itself that we're going to talk about this morning. But rather the revelation, the learning, the transformative experience of what happens when we suffer. The choice to cling to the author of life in spite of everything that has fallen apart, broken, and so not right in this life. The choice is yours to protect your heart, to preserve your sanity, and to maintain your character Those, I think, are the gifts. Alan Noble wrote in his uh, book, I'll tell you about it uh, here in a little while, that life will inevitably uh, crush you at one point or another. And your response to that suffering will testify to something. I wonder, what will your life say in those moments? It's my belief that second only to the miracle of God's patience and grace to forgive us and then save us, the profound mystery is that God expects us to remain faithful to him through life's disappointments, mistakes, hardships, and tragedies. It can be miserable. It can be heart-wrenching. It can be so daily. But if you'll allow me, I think I might have a few thoughts that will help us to fight the battle well so that we can hold on to our faith in God and to do so with a good conscience. At least twice in this short book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 17 and 2, verse 11, Peter refers to his readers as foreigners and or exiles. He then proceeds to mention some form of suffering in every chapter of the book. He spends more time talking about the word suffering in this letter than any other author in the entire New Testament. I mean, yes, Paul uses the word 27 times, but it took him 10 books to do it in. 
Peter does, uh, mentions it 18 times in just five chapters. It's as if he's saying, this is normal, people. In the New Testament, all sorts of people have experienced suffering. Men, women, mother-in-laws, fathers, children, government leaders, apostles, servants, our Jewish ancestors, the Hebrews, and they all ex- they experienced all sorts of maladies. Uh, some of you can identify with a number of these things in the list, like physical dis- conditions like disease and dysentery, dropsy, famine, fever, hemorrhaging, paralysis, seizures, severe pain, snake bites, and even execution. To say nothing of suffering caused by bad dreams and demons and soldiers and religious leaders and even divisions in the church. It's interesting to me that Peter never berates his readers like a crusty old marine drill sergeant, just suck it up and keep on going, or like the invincible marine chesty puller, pain is just weakness leaving the body. Peter doesn't coddle the reader. He doesn't just say things to make us feel better about our circumstances. Instead, he normalizes suffering. In effect, Peter says, don't be surprised. Chapter 1, verses, uh, sorry, uh, 1 Peter 4, 12 to 9. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. He goes on to say, if you're insulted and if you suffer and if you suffer, if you suffer, don't be ashamed. Paul will add to that in Philippians 1.29, For it has been granted on you, uh, to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. And again in 2 Timothy 3.12, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I'm not sure what your spiritual devotional habits are. I'm terribly inconsistent at uh, journaling. I like the idea of it. But then when I sit down, I tend to write a book, and that takes too much time. This summer, while I was on vacation, since I had a little extra time, I decided to, to spend some time reflecting on John 15. And you can't read John 15 about Jesus being the vine and us being the branches without going a little bit wider in both directions of the context to chapter three, or 13, verses 16. Chapter 16 begins and ends with a a powerful and clear explanation for why Jesus spoke all that he did in in chapters 13 to 16, which, by the way, are not recorded anywhere else. It takes place right before, uh, or kind of during the final supper and right before they go to the Garden of Gethsemane and before he's executed. He explains everything in chapter 16, verse 1, by saying, I'm telling you all these things so that you will not fall away. And the ultimate antidote to all the comments about the disciples' anxiety that they express in chapters 14 to 16, uh, John addresses that in 1633. He says, all the hatred you may have experienced, all the persecution, all the trouble is withstandable because Jesus himself overcame the world. Thus, if he can do it, you can too. When we are hated because he was hated, he overcame so that we can too. Anyway. You get the idea. You can learn a lot of good from theology from people who have suffered and remained faithful to God. I recall one of my college professors about the time that he was nearing retirement. Um, he was doing a devotion in front of the, all the college employees at a, as a, at a gathering. And he expressed that he, the things that he and his wife were hoping to do in retirement... Um, he, he talked about what he was not looking forward to uh, in the next phase of life, like filling his calendar with doctor visits, because that's what you do when you're 70 plus. But I'll never forget the moment that he ended the, the devotion with these thoughts. He said something very positive that only, I think, a mature believer in Christ could say at that point in his life. It was something to the effect like this. The process of aging is a profound reminder that we are not home. Actually, I think that might be the first gift for us to consider this morning about suffering, and that's that it is a profound reminder that we are not yet home. As you've learned already in your time here, growth never takes place in a vacuum. It requires a particular context mixed with the right ingredients. And for Peter, suffering is just such a context. It doesn't matter if you're a slave or a wife or a husband or a Christian or a leader in the church or some combination of all of these things. Suffering is a theological impetus to become more like Christ 
but it's harder than you may think. <laughs> First Peter four, uh, chapter 1, 14 to 16, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Or in chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, evil, slander. Ve- Daryl, are you taking notes for the student handbook? Okay. Like newborn babes, pra- crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you've, been tested, now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. Or in chapter 2, verses 11 to 17, if you haven't found something for your life yet, abstain from sinful desires. That sums everything up. Live as free people. Paul is uh, surprisingly a little bit more eloquent and untypically succinct in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 4. He says that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. This summer, I had a very unexpected conversation with a family member who's been through a really rough year. Uh, He's had uh, severe uh, nerve pain, numbness, and weakness in his hands and his neck and his legs. And they discovered earlier this year that he needed to have carpal tunnel surgery done in both of his hands. But uh, doctors delayed that because of a second diagnosis. He has a disease called ankylosing spondylitis or what they nickname bamboo spine. It's a chronic inflammatory condition where your vertebrae slowly fuse together. So in April, he underwent a pretty uh, uh, similar uh, surgery to what Dr. Billy went through last fall. His total recovery time from surgery to home lasted more than three weeks. It was only supposed to take two to three days. So this summer, when he and his wife came for a visit, my wife thought shopping was a great way to spend time together at the mall. Anybody in favor of that? You don't get to graduate. All right. <laughs> John and I quickly found our way, instead of shopping, we found our way to a set of couches in the middle of the mall, and we proceeded to sit there and talk about all sorts of things related to life, like, you know, football, and he's a farmer, so we talked about farming and retire Anyway, and then out of the blue, drops the mic on me when he says, what do you think about Revelation 4.11? I don't know, why are you asking? Revelation 4.11, it's a text describing the throne room of heaven with the 24 elders gathered around along with the four living creatures and everyone is heaven in heaven worshiping God. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. And then he dropped this reflection on top of that. If God has created all things, and if all things are to worship him, how can I reconcile the pain, the lost time, lost life, and possible permanent loss of mobility? How do I reconcile that with a God who created all things, including including pain and suffering? It's a really good question. You may be familiar with the name Johnny Erickson Tata. She reconciled it by describing her swimming accident that left her paralyzed from the neck down as a glorious intruder to what otherwise would have been a comfortable middle-class life. In a different book, When God Weeps, she writes that we are civilized and so is our view of God, but hardships press us up against God, and the greatest good suffering can do for me is to, hear this, increase my capacity for God. She goes on to say, God uses suffering to purge sin from our lives, strengthen our commitment to him, force us to to depend on grace, bind us together with other believers, produce discernment, foster sensitivity, discipline our minds, spend our time wisely, stretch our hope, cause us to know Christ better, make us long for truth, lead us to repentance of sin, teach us to give thanks in times of sorrow, increase faith, and strengthen character. In other words... It's an opportunity for deeper discipleship, for wisdom, and for character development. So while the first gift that we may be able to receive from suffering is the reminder that we're not home yet, the second gift may be 
to let us know that it is suffering is a context for faith and to trust in God and for those to develop. Peter seems to appreciate that suffering can produce loneliness and isolation. And so he offers a number of ways to uh, counterbalance that. 1 Peter 4, 7 to 11, I'll just start abbreviating here. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. In chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, again, abbreviated. To the elders among you, be shepherds of God's flock. In the same way, you who are younger, submit to your elders. Humble yourself. Cast your anxiety on him because he cares about you. Be alert and sober-minded. Resist the evil one, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And after you have suffered a little while, he will himself restore you to make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Again, Paul is uncharacteristically succinct in 1 Corinthians 12, 26. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. There's a common question and we tend to ask when major catastrophes and tragedies occur. And the question is this, where is God in this? Or if I could borrow the title of Philip Yancey's book, Where is God When It Hurts? Just in the past couple of weeks, there's been, I, I noted five things just right off the top of my head. There's been a massive wildfire in Maui, at least 115 dead and 66 missing. A massive earthquake in Morocco. Nearly 2,500 people are believed to be dead. Just the other day, uh, I think yesterday, catastrophic flood in Libya killing 2,000 and there are as many as 10,000 that are missing right now. And yesterday was another anniversary, anniversary of 9-11 in New York City where 2,753 were presumed dead. And after 27, or 22 years, only 1,647 of those people have been identified. That doesn't even include the 71,000 individuals, construction workers, people who were employed in that area of, of the city, and all the emergency response personnel and military who have either died or have lived with significant physical and mental health conditions over the past 22 years because they worked in or near the fallen buildings. This weekend I was visiting a church with a couple of people in Florida it was announced that there were two people from their congregation very close to my age. They were 49 and 51. They were murdered this week by a family member. You have your lists too. <laughs> I think of a family that we sat with a number of years ago in a hospital waiting room, nearly ripped apart when mom and newborn child were seconds away from death in a very difficult birthing situation. I think of former students whose lives ended before age 25 or who experienced various degrees of tragedies because of car crashes, cancer diagnosis, or who were victims of heinous crimes. I think of military personnel who have returned from Afghanistan and Iraq in the past, past 20 years with mental and physical scars that have forever changed their lives and that of their families. I think of ministries that have gone up in smoke despite all your best efforts. Co-workers with lifelong autoimmune diseases and food allergies, allergies caused by a simple tick bite. Divorce, being a child of divorce, premature babies, children with birth defects and diseases, not being able to have children at all, siblings with lifelong severe debilitating maladies and the inability to care for themselves in the simplest of daily hygiene and self-care, children who make illegal and immoral life decisions, parents with Alzheimer's disease and have anger, angry outbursts with that, poverty and incredible financial hardships, lives snuffed out too soon. This week is the eighth year anniversary of my sister's passing or when life with your spouse or your children don't turn out the way you envisioned it. <laughs> Lord, it is common for us to wonder, even demand to know in an almost imprecatory fashion, why don't you do something about this? Here's Yancey's direct response, direct response to our question and to this text. 
He says in his book, Where is God, is God When It Hurts? He responds, Today, if I had to answer the question, Where is God When It Hurts? in a single sentence, I would make that sentence another question. Where is the church when it hurts? We form the front lines of God's response to the suffering world. <laughs> Sufferings as a gift? Really? Yes. Because they remind us that we're not home yet. And they tell us that it is a context for faith and trust to develop. But it's also a call for God's people to be in his presence, to be his presence here on earth. So I ask the question to you this morning, do you want to die? Maybe a better question is, do you want to get out of bed? Alan Noble wrote a really short book that was published this year about mental and physical suffering. He entitled it, On Getting Out of Bed, the Burden, of, uh, the Burden and Gift of Living. He writes this, The most fundamental decision in the, uh, is the decision to get out of bed, and it too communicates something. The decision to get out of bed is the decision to live. It is a claim that life is worth living despite the risk and uncertainty and the inevitability of suffering. Is suffering a gift, I ask? Well, I kind of think First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 9 is the key to that. I'm not going to read that. But he basically summarizes with the gift is not the absence of suffering. The ultimate gift is, received, is receiving the promised reward for having lived a faithful life. I understand that the experience of pain and suffering in this life and the dailiness of it make it hard, make it really hard to feel like your salvation is worth it to keep on going, especially when you just want the suffering to end and in your life and the lives of those around you. But could I challenge you with this one thought? Please get out of bed and let's take the hand of God and walk this journey with him racing forward with everything that we have. Let me pray. Father God, you have been incredibly patient with us for lots of reasons. You give us more opportunities than we deserve, and you treat us so much better than we deserve. So we say thank you. We also pray, Lord Maranatha, Father, we long to see you. We long to be made right in your presence. We long to see those who have gone before us. We long to see the inadequacies of this life fulfilled and remedied. Give us strength. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Sean. As we continue to worship today, we're going to sing a new song that uh, you probably don't know the melody to, but you definitely know the words. And it's, it sings through Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, there's nothing that I need. So as we continue today, I pray that you will meditate on these words and let them wash over you as a reminder that when it's hard, God is right next to you, guiding you through this life till the day that we can be with him for eternity. Let's stand and continue to worship. The Lord is my shepherd, there's nothing I need. He led me to the
Thank you, worship team, and uh, thank you, Sean, for that powerful reminder that the suffering that we're going through is a, is a signpost that God has something better for us. And I was particularly moved by the idea that we may be God's response to the suffering that people are going through. Thank you for that reminder. Let's pray together, and then we will leave our worship there. Thank you, Father. Thank you that we stand in the midst of the community of Christ. Thank you, Father, that this is not the final product of your grace. But in the intermediate, it gives us context for our eternal faith. Thank you for this week that stretches before us. Help us be agents of your grace to a dark and dying world. Thank you that we live in this community to become an earmark of faithful obedience. We love you, Father. Thank you for your mercy. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. Please put up our chairs.